All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Donnelly from Fathom Consulting. And today, Elizabeth and I are going to talk about design and development communication to ensure that what you're creating is usable. And we're really going to be focusing on that design and developer relationship. So as I said, my name is Mary Donnelly. I'm a principal consultant at Adam Consulting. I've been with them for over 17 years. Most of the work I do is in the research and design space for medical devices. So I've worked with a lot of um, large medical device clients in Minneapolis and then as, as well around the world. And I'm gonna have Elizabeth introduce herself. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I've been with Fathom over 13 years, and I've been working in the digital space since before we called it the digital space. I've always been at that place where technology and the user and the business come together, and I've worked on interfaces for um, lots of medical device company, um, medical device uh, interfaces, but also, you know, all the way up to um, e-commerce experiences and other kinds of experiences. And really, it's just all about making uh, things usable for the user and uh, helping the developers do what they do best. Great. Thanks for that, Elizabeth. So Fathom Consulting is a consulting company based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Even though now with COVID, many of us are remote, but still within the Twin Cities area working from home. We have been around for over 20 years and really where we focus on is working on really complex products, systems, um, different projects, and just really want to ensure that whatever we're working on, we're understanding the user. Uh, we think of them first and we're just we're really always bringing their needs uh, to the forefront and thinking about them throughout the, the development process. One of the things that we do among others is we have a really robust UX capability. So we have conducted qualitative and quantitative research all around the world. We've spent lots of times in, in different settings observing uh, patients, clinicians, different types of users to really understand what they're doing out in the field, spending time creating prototypes, doing usability testing. And we really believe that it's so important to spend a lot of time in that concept and prototyping phase before, you, phase before you get into development or even do a single line of code. Code just so, so at that point you can still, you can continue to make changes, you can continue to, to iterate and, and get feedback. And then it just results in um, products that are really user um, based and, and user centered and focused. These pictures here, are just some of the work that we've done, um, you know, taking pictures at uh, the first, the top there is uh, a picture of me in an OR in Japan. The bottom is one of our UX consultants doing some work at a steel mill in Indiana. So we're quite diverse in our capabilities and the, and the types of products that we touch. You know, whenever we um, start a, a project, it, we can, it depends on the size, really what we're working on, but this is approach that we often take, especially if we're thinking about uh, developing a medical device product. So where we really start is, you know, understanding what are the needs of the business, uh, conducting observations of the user so we can really understand the environments that they're working in, the systems that they're using. From there, we'll do interviews with the users get more information will often go into a design workshop and then these can be anywhere from 10 to 40 50 people we really like to include not just those internal stakeholders and business but also users and that may mean that we're bringing in clinicians nurses or doctors as part of that design workshop to really sit at the table with us and and get their their input into how a system should behave in the future um, after that, we'll do multiple rounds of formative testing. Formative is really just a, a fancy FDA term for usability testing. Um, and, you know, I think we do as many rounds as we can, so we, we get, you know, a really good feeling about it. Obviously, this is a space that you continually come back to even after you have completely developed something. Because every time um, you learn something new from each user, 
And then after that is really when you can get into the, the graphic design. So the formative testing, you're testing prototypes, more wireframes. And then after that, you're adding that creative layer on onto the system. You'll often even go back at the stage and do more formative testing. And that, then there is when development starts to take over and the coding and the last stage is the summative testing, or this would be that final round of testing that the FDA needs to really prove that a system is safe for the users, you know, be that patients or clinicians. So what we're going to focus on today is those, those area, the <clears throat> thinking about the development process and where developers or those coders are really playing a role. And they play a role right throughout this process. So in the beginning, when we think of doing those interviews with the stakeholders and doing the observations, it's very important that they are listening to these, that they are also getting their questions answered. You know, oftentimes the questions that we have are focused on, you know, what are the users tasks? What are they doing? What are the business needs? But the developers also have, have questions, um, especially in hospital environments, they're trying to understand, you know, what are some of the security requirements? Is the system going to connect to something else? What are the needs around that? And all of this is going to be input into how they think about the system or how that needs to be developed. The next phase, um, the customer interviews are kind of that first initial round of research. It's very important um, that the developers are hearing firsthand what are, their, what are the needs of the users, what are the environments they're going to be using the system in. And if you're able to give the developers that mental model up front, they can carry that in their heads and keep it with them as they're developing the system and thinking about those trade-offs, right? You know, if they understand what the user does, it's going to allow them to make decisions faster, um, and just to really onboard themselves quicker into what needs to happen. In the workshop too, this is also a great space to bring in the developers. You know, as I said, um, we'll often bring in those end users, right? The customers, the people that are gonna be using the system. And if the developers are hearing from them, you know, why one thing works over another, it helps them to build that empathy, to build that, that mental model of what is needed. It also allows them to hear from the business, you know, what the business is trying to, to achieve. And I think it just, any, anybody you can get um, involved at this stage in that design workshop is really going to, you know, get by and um, really ensure that they know that they are, are involved in this process and they're a great, you know, big team player. At the next stage of the formative testing, so this is the usability testing. As I said, you may do multiple rounds and it's very important when you're doing those report outs that they are listening, right? That they understand and they can watch the design evolve. And we found that this is really, this is super important because by the time it gets to them, it there's less questions about, well, did you try this or did you try this? Or why didn't we go down this path? If they understand, you know, where did you start and where are you now and how did you get there? If they understand what that story is and they're involved um, every step of the way, there's going to be less of those questions and more understanding from them about why things have been done a certain way. They're going to be able to look at those requirements and know, understand kind of the vetting process and what has really gone in to form each one of those. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth to go through the last steps here. Sure. So when we move into the GUI design, after all the, the work that Mary just took us through, you know, the, the UX team is still leading the charge here and, and we're keeping those user needs at the center. But again, including developers as much as we can here uh, is really great. And this obviously varies by pro project by project, um, but I want to take you through a recent example of what we did. Um, so on, on this recent example, we've got this, um, this piece of equipment that we're redesigning. And what we did was we started with the user's workflow, again, keeping the user at the center. And we mapped out probably five or six different um, sub workflows from their whole, from the whole, uh, the whole workflow. Then the first thing we focused on were the GUI screen. So these are the black squares you see represented on the screen here. 
And for each GUI screen, we defined the, the copy on the screen, the calls to action. Um, there's other some other relevant information that was unique to this particular piece of equipment. But we also are, are mapping out here, you can see the flow, the linear flow left to right. And this is really driven by a couple of different things, uh, decision points and application and firmware actions. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. So um, this particular application, as most do, um, have, have some logic behind it in that if, if a particular system setting is set to A, we want to display screen one. If it's set to B, display screen two. So we're really mapping out all of those decision points here. And those are represented by the diamonds, if I can advance my screen, um, that you see here on, on the screen. Another thing that we've documented here are um, some of the, the actions taken by the, both the firmware and the application. Um, things like if a user enters a value on the screen, uh, do we need to retain that value for use later? Or another example would be if there's a sensor on the system that needs to that we need to start paying attention to because if it if that sensor fires we need to display a particular screen, so we're mapping out all of that um, here in this workflow, and it's not just the UX team doing that. We're involving the app the application team and we're involving the the firmware team, and this let them do a few different things. One is it started the conversation between the two. Um, groups of developers to say who is responsible for what. So in this particular case, um, there are some, some decisions that could be made either and, and kept either by the firmware or the application, but the teams had a chance to talk about it way up front about who should be keeping track of what. The other thing it did is it allowed us to have conversations with the developers about things that may be completely transparent to the user, but were a big deal to the developers. And they're able to uh, make recommendations on how some things should be treated, um, still meeting the user need, but making it um, easier or better uh, for the application. And really thinking about that whole end-to-end -end flow helped with, with seeing that entire picture and, and taking in those, um, those recommendations. So that was a, a, a great first step in, in mapping out the workflow. The next thing we did was get into the, um, the, the user interface spec. So these are pretty typical um, pieces that you'd expect in any software development. Um, what we did was the, the, entire, the entire system was based on templates and components, which again is pretty common. Components are things like buttons, sliders, toggles, drop down menus, overlays, things like that. But by involving the developers up front, and especially the front end uh, developers, of course, uh, we we're able to, to talk with them about things as we're developing them. So uh, really helping them to understand the kind of interaction that the user wants. And in some cases, they observe them um, interacting with a prototype and they want to understand here's how they want to use a slider um, or here's what that means to, to the user. So the, the front end developers not only understood it, but they were able to weigh in on any questions we might have about how something should, should work or could work. Um, another great example in this is that as we were developing this user interface, uh, the designer chose a particular font, and by involving the developers early on, uh, we did some testing and things and discovered that the font that was chosen wasn't going to work uh, for the system from a licensing perspective. And so uh, we were able to quickly and easily change out the font that was, uh, you know, the, de the designer selected a new font. Um, and that happened way ahead of any code being written. So obviously there was a um, benefit of having that, that decision discovered early. Um, so that was the UI spec. So once we started, we've, we've got our user flows defined, we've got our UX or our UI specifications defined. Then it came to documenting the specifications for each GUI screen. So we used the, um, in this case, we used the client's uh, documentation tool, requirements management tool. And we created a record for every single screen. And this became sort of the, the Bible or the marching orders for the entire team, uh, UX and development together. It really helped to, to consolidate and give people one place to look for the information on, on what, uh, what each screen needed to do. So for each of them, we, we identified the template and the one-to-many components that were used on the screen. We talked a little bit of, already about um, templates and components. Um, another thing we did here is we pulled out the, the copy on the screen into its own field. Um, and and it, it, it seems simple, but what it allows us to do is downstream 
when CAPI changes, it's not if CAPI changes, it's when CAPI changes, um, we have one place to go to make that update. And everybody is, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's one spot that can be easily accessed and reviewed and approved um, to make the, any updates pretty seamless. The next thing we, we identified for each GUI screen is the conditions for display in advancing. And this is the, the on-ramps and the off-ramps for every single screen. So um, there's one too many ways to get to a screen and get that to display, and there's one too many ways for that, that screen to move on. And so we're able to document in here um, the, these conditions. And by having involved development early on and taking them through the user flow and having them participate in the user flow development, it was really easy for us to document this and check it out with them and make sure that they understood what it meant. Um, so that was a, a super helpful piece too. And then of course the artwork that's on the screen, we're able to, to document that for the screen and talk about not only what file to display, but any conditions, um, you know, if it's an animation, does it play on a loop, things like that. So it's really the audience for, for these um, particular records is, is everybody. And it allowed them to create um, software requirements, test plans, uh, pass criteria, um, and really start getting into, um, into the development itself. Oops, let me back up a second, there we go. Um, so, so up until this point, the UX team has been Kind of leading the charge, creating the the specifications um, both on the UI side and and within the um, requirements tool, and then as we head into development for, uh, into development support, the the tables kind of turn, the script flips a little bit in that now the development team are the ones producing the content and we're part we're involved as reviewers, so we're reviewing software requirements, we're participating in sprint reviews, and now we're uh, ensuring that what was captured and all the, the work done in the GUI design steps is showing up in the software requirements and in the software itself, making sure that the intent is um, uh, right and still represents the user needs. So that as they move into, into you know, beyond software requirements writing and into development, um, we're getting it right. So um, reducing the rework here because of all the work that we've done uh, up to this point. So I'll hand it back to Mary here. Great, thanks Elizabeth. So this last step is summative testing, um, which is something that the FDA needs in order uh, for you to say, yep, we have tested this, this, this system is safe. And this testing um, is testing on the fully developed Product. So you need to really understand from development, when is that going to happen? Like, when is the product going to be pretty much almost all the way developed in a state that can be tested with users? And you need to bring in the users and have them do tasks on this, the system. So it's working with development to understand those dates because this effort can be, can be quite large depending on how many user groups you have. Because for each user group, you need to bring in 15 participants. You need to train them on the actual training that they'll have on the system and then have them do testing. So each of these sessions can you know, be up to four hours long. It could take months to plan for this testing to get everybody in the same place. And then anything that comes out of summative testing. So if there are user errors with the systems or things that you're, you're seeing that need to be changed, that needs to be communicated to the development team so that those changes can be made before this product is commercialized. So that's really kind of the handholding that goes on at this point. You know, obviously when you're doing this, because you've done that formative testing and you've worked so closely with the developers and the users throughout the process, it's more of something to say like, hey, look how great the system is and everybody can use it, which is really where you want to end up. All right. So we've taken you through those seven steps. We've given you some examples, and now we're going to open it up to everybody listening for questions and answers.